Welcome. Glad to see you all here. Thank you, uh, Naomi and Greg, for pulling this great meeting together. Um, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about aircraft observations. Uh, coming from Miami and having spent about 30 years flying in hurricanes and collecting data, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the inner core data that Chris so nicely brought up and how we deal with that. Um, and really, I think I'm going to speak not only from the NOAA hurricane research perspective, but also from the HFIP perspective. Uh, Bob and I are kind of the only reps of the leadership of HFIP here, so uh, we're very interested in this, and we're very glad that to see HWARF coming out. Uh, when I'm, you've heard a lot about HFIP off and on. I'm not going to talk to you much about that. Uh, I think we had some nice overviews of the objectives of HFIP and what we're trying to do. I want to talk about how HFIP interacts with what we've always been doing. Well, not always. For a long time, we've been doing about 50 years uh, in hurricane research, and in particular, I'm going to talk about how we're trying to blend the traditional hurricane research activities, which were mainly around OBS analysis database and instrument R&D, some statistical dynamical that you heard about from Mark, and then the advances of operational models have been, that have been going on at EMC for years, and how in the HFIP realm, what we're trying to do is we're trying to accelerate a lot of that stuff to reach these very daunting objectives, as James put it, uh, for improving particularly intensity forecasting. And where we're going there uh, is experimental models. You heard about that, uh, both from the, the HRH talks and the, all the model, the great model talks we heard yesterday. Uh, but looking at data simulation techniques that Sharon did, and again, looking at OBS system strategy and analysis, how are we using all these OBS, how are we going to get them all in there, how are we going to make uh, the models respond, if they can, to this. And then use the data also as a model evaluation tool. Uh, I think that the real way that we're going to make success in HFIP is by getting the OBS people and the modeling people looking at the same thing. No more modelers talking to modelers and doing what they do. No more observationalists doing it and saying, no, the models don't see what I see. We got to work together. And I think the data simulation systems are really where the glue is going to happen. Uh, the, the example I, get, I, I think is a great example is what Mark showed about how you are mapping the model attractor onto the satellite OBS attractor and seeing how bad the model is doing the microphysics and the satellite imagery. The same thing has to happen for all of our OBS systems that we have out there. And I think this is a great, great opportunity for us to do it. And I think these partnerships that we've forged in NOAA, I hope, will you know, through HFIP, will bridge out into the research community, and this will be an opening uh, to this discussion. So I want to look, for the student purposes, I want to talk a little bit about what we do in OPS. You've heard a lot about modeling. You've heard a lot about data simulation. Uh, what do we know about the inner core? Well, most of what we know about the inner core comes from NOAA field programs um, and some of the NASA, uh, NASA ones and the NOAA ones and our joint NSF ones. Uh, but NOAA, for years, for 50 years now, has been going out and flying in the storms. We have three aircraft. We have two P3s. We have a G4 uh, high-flying aircraft. We can do in situ data, wind, pressure, temperature. We can even do microphysics and aerosol if we put the instrumentation on the plane. Uh, we have expendables. You've heard about dropsons. We also have ocean probes. Nick Shea will talk a little bit more about the ocean today. Uh, and then we have a lot of remote sensors. The ones I'm most familiar with are the Doppler radar a step frequency microwave radiometer. These are all measuring wind. This year we're going to have a Doppler wind LIDAR in partnership with ONR. Uh, we have a, what is WSRA scan? It's wide scanning radar altimeter. Right, but it's basically a radar that looks at the sea surface and gives us waves. Uh, we have a scatterometer and a profiler on board the plane. And now we're starting to dabble with UASs. Uh, NOAA is bought into the Global Hawk at NASA. Uh, we are looking at a Coyote, which is a small deployable UAS probe. We've flown aerosons. Uh, so we're, we're bringing all these tools to the fore. Now, up until now, most of these OBS have been going into diagnostics or into uh, simple tools for the hurricane specialists. As Sharon pointed out, data simulation and getting them into the model, if we're going to make improvements, are the key. Now, how can we, what, what do we use these tools for? Sharon talked about large scale. We use the G4 primarily with dropsons to fly around the vortex and to sample its environment. We've gotten good performance uh, improvements uh, through our operational models in this uh, for track. But this is, again, not the inner core data. This is looking at the environment of the storm. 
uh, but we've been able to do a lot in improving the track with the model improvements, the data assimilation improvements, and adding these observations. And this was a, a good interaction that happened over the last 15 years, as you saw from yesterday's plots with the track forecast improvements. All of these things were going on at the same time. Uh, so that a lot of this stuff has been feeding off. And that's really where HFIP is taking its ideas from for the inner core. Uh, we had model improvements, data simulation improvements, and OBS improvements. But they all work together. And the challenge is, how do we do that in the inner core? Now, what tools do we have to look at the inner core? Well, we've flown the aircraft for years in patterns like this. This happens to be Katrina, where we just do figure four patterns in the core. Uh, and we get flight level data. Now that's useful because it's one level, but it's wind. Uh, but the, the, the innovation is we can add Doppler radar to it. And by flying these patterns, the Doppler radar is a radar mounted on site, gives us a full 3D snapshot of the storm like a CAT scan. And so we can get a full 3D wind field. This happens to be an analysis we do in real time on the aircraft. We do all the quality control. We produce analysis on aircraft and we ship them down to NHC. Taking that innovation, we can also start to provide data for data assimilation. Also, the Doppler radar gives you full vertical structure, too. Uh, this is a vertical cross-section through the storm on that same flight leg. Uh, you can see the eye wall. This is the tangential wind structure. This is the secondary circulation, the radial wind and the vertical wind. Uh, because of the Doppler is giving you a full three-dimensional scan, you can get a lot of information about the three-dimensional structure of the storm. Also, we've been developing new techniques to look at things that we need for model development. This same scanning strategy, what you saw with the mean, the mean analysis, okay? If you look at that and say, okay, if I want to look at turbulence structure, what's the variance? And when you look at the variance, you start to get some innovate, really interesting information. We'd heard a lot yesterday about the boundary layer roles and the boundary layer structure and turbulence from George and Rich. We're able to pull out what, what, what an estimate of TKE, at least what's resolvable by the Doppler, by taking a 10-kilometer swath, kind of like you do when you're doing flights with in situ data, and looking at the variance over that thin strip, about 10 kilometers wide on either side of the aircraft, and we can get the turbulent energy. Now, anybody who's flown in a hurricane knows where you're going to hit turbulence, down in the boundary layer when you go through the eye wall convection. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We're also seeing that uh, the turbulent kinetic energy is higher, actually, in the eye wall itself, kind of alluding to George's comments about the vertical structure and the horizontal structure of the scales. Uh, down here, there's the vertical is very strong vertical gradient, and it's pretty much concentrated right in the boundary layer with the you know, variances on the order of uh, 15 to 20 meters squared per second squared. But up in here, it's on the order of 25 meters squared per second squared. And a lot of that is the convective bubbles are better resolved, I think, by the Doppler radar. So this is a, an interesting area that we can use to help with the model diagnostics. Now, when we fly the Doppler, like I said, we can also provide data simulation uh, services. Because we're doing the quality control in these analysis. So we've been working through uh, HFIP with Fu Ching Zhang at uh, Penn State to develop a super op system that we can do on the fly. Uh, we did a very similar thing with the GSI and Ching Fu and, and the group at EMC. Uh, and, and so we're trying different technologies through the GSI and through the ENKF. This was the first time we were able to try and assimilate this data in real time. Uh, and it was really kind of interesting. I, the story I tell is we had the 64 kilobaud modem on the plane to send the data off, and we were driving this 65,000 processor computer sitting in Texas with one 64 kilobaud modem. But it was effective. We send about 5,000 OBS in, and we try and assimilate them, and then look at the innovations. So we've been doing this for a couple of years now. Uh, this is Hurricane Bill, an example. We were flying, as part of this IFEX experiment, we've developed a strategy with our partnerships with the modeling team. Because if you're going to collect data for assimilation, you have to set up a, the plumbing. How do we get the data from the plane into EMC and to get it used? So we came up with a strategy working with our partners in operations to fly every 12 hours. The P3s are on a 12-hour cycle, either 0 and 12Z or 18 and 6. We've tried both. And we go out there repeatedly, time after time after time, every 12 hours to collect data. Now, at the same time, we're getting these analysis. And then we're providing the super ops. The Fu Ching is then doing ensemble runs uh, with Wharf ARW. We're going to start doing it with HWARF this summer. 
Um, so that's going to be our goal. At the same time, so these are examples of forecasts. Here's your ensemble spread. Here's a wind swath from the, from the storm. You notice Bill is pretty predictable, very narrow spread in the, in the forecast tracks, very narrow spread in the ensemble of intensity. That's not always true. We had Erica, we had Danny, very different structures. So I'm showing you the good case, not the bad case. Um, but there are possibilities and potential here. There's many ways to do super robbing. There's many ways to do the sampling. So we're trying to look at, well, an example of how we're doing. We've done this for about seven or eight cases. Uh, and we're always seeing when we have the Doppler, uh, when we're assim assimilating data, which is the red bars, we get better performance than we do if we don't assimilate the Doppler. Of course, that's with GFS. So this is kind of a cooked system. But we're showing that there is innovation coming from the intercore data, at least in this situation. Now, the other thing is we don't know quite how to do this. So we're looking at uh, observing system strategy type experiments to assess the ability to assimilate Doppler in different situations. This is an example where we're using WARF, HWARF, uh, an experimental version running at three kilometers that we have at HRD, uh, where we're initializing from GFS. We're running a 30-member ensemble. And we're doing a, what's called a perfect twin. So we're running the model to generate the super OBS. Uh, the simulated OBS, and then we're assimilating them back into the system to see how well we do. Uh, and so we're developing an OSI capability, and here's the innovations. Here's your control without no data assimilation. Here's your nature run, and this is where we're trying to get, well, this is what we get from the innovation. Uh, and this happens to be pressure, so the control without data assimilation is 1,000. Uh, the, the, the nature is 984, and we were able to get 990 using it. And so we're playing with the different data simulation strategies and looking at the sampling and how we can better get at uh, a, a better wind field. And here's your uh, wind. Now, the nice thing about ENKF is that we can use, um, we can look at the innovations both in the wind and in the thermal because there's a relationship between them in the model. Okay, Naomi is standing up, so I'll move on. Uh, you're going to hear more about this from Nick. I don't want to take too much time. I'll skip over this. Um, I wanted to mainly get the Doppler out there. I think a critical thing that should be mentioned, and I said it already, is that really where the innovation is going to come, you heard about all these runs, these model runs. How are we going to digest all this information? Um, and so this is a critical area. And we need better techniques to evaluate the model. Uh, not only the inner core, uh, we have tools like HWIND, where we can look at the wind structure. Here's the HWARF model run. Here's the observed. You can see there's a lot of difference in structure already. The storm's too big, too broad, too strong. We can look at RZ mean. You saw that already. Compare the Doppler to the model at different resolutions. And then we can look at convective structure through the CFADs and look at the different variability of the convective variability. The other thing is, of course, how do we bring these data sets together? We have model data sets that are three-dimensional cubes over huge volumes. We have OBS that are simple little puffs. How do we bring these data sets together to look at them in a common framework? So we've got to look at visualization. And the, the idea I have is something where you'll see something like this, where you could blend on the same scale the flight level data and then to bring in the model data and do a direct comparison with them in a georeference format so that we can actually get some innovation from the model ops. Last thing I want to close with is what's happening. You're going to hear about a number of field programs right after my talk. Uh, in 2010, we have a major one coming up. You're going to hear about GRIP, the Genesis and Rapid Intensity Process. You've already heard about IFEX. We're going to merge or collaborate with the NASA folks. You're going to hear that from Scott. Uh, we have the pre-depression investigation of cloud systems in the tropics, or PREDICT, that Chris Davis and Mike Montgomery and a number of other Scott, uh, Lance Bozard and, and, and Andy Heinsfield are running. And we're bringing a number of assets. What we're trying to do is map these onto HFIP objectives. We want to get the most out of the bucks. And I'll f end up with the key to the success, I think, is partnership. And on the NOAA side, we've gotten the research community. We're taking advantage of all the assets we have in NOAA to work together with operations. 
in a very close coordinated contact, and we're bringing in our other federal and academic partners into this part into this collaboration. Uh, we're using a more integrated access and support of the test beds. You heard about DTC, which we're at, JTW, uh, JHT, and JCSDA. Blend traditional hurricane research with the new HFIP activities. And then I think a key thing is this manpower diversity, that we have this huge diverse community that we can take advantage of and take that diversity to add to the total. Thanks.